Welcome to the Silver Screen Guide Podcast, where we discuss films from every genre. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the podcast. Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah to our Jewish listeners. This is your co-host Corbin, and we are doing a very special Christmas episode this year. Last year was It's a Wonderful Life, and this year it's A Miracle on 34th Street, which I've seen quite a bit. I have not seen this one. (laughs) This is one that I know everybody else has seen, and yet I have not. And currently, actually, I just got back from college, uh, and I am hunkered down in my parents' bedroom. (laughs) <laughs> because I don't have anything set up to record, and my bedroom right now is a complete mess of all my stuff, so this is what I've been brought to currently. Alan has been missing out on this great movie, so I am glad that this uh, Christmas we got to record this special episode and discuss this movie, and he, he gets to see it for the first time. So I'm very interested to know what... Alan thinks of this movie coming to it as an adult because I saw this movie. We owned it on VHS when I was young. And I'm, I, as far as I remember, we watched it pretty much every Christmas. Right. And until uh, we kind of phased out of the VHSs and we never picked it up on DVD. And that's been a long time since we haven't used VHS in our home. And we don't even have a VHS player now. So... Even if we did still have it, which I think we do, we there's no way we could have watched it. But right. recently, I just picked it up on DVD. It was on Amazon for like five bucks. And it also came with the digital HD. I didn't even know they packaged those with DVDs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They, it's not, I think it's maybe as more common as it is now. But uh, I remember when I'm back before I started actually collecting Blu rays, I'd always get uh, the digital copy in those and the cases. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't I didn't know that cuz I don't buy DVDs anymore. Right. So the digital HD is kind of funny because the DVD is standard definition, but I got the HD copy for streaming, but well, that's I, funny. I it is kind of funny, but I watched it off of Plex and you know what? The digital uh, not the digital. Well, technically it's digital, but the DVD quality I, it didn't look bad to me. Right. And yeah, that's interesting because every digital copy that I got with my DVDs back when I was collecting them, it was always the standard definition one. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder if it's just a standard now where they just do they just do high definition and don't really keep around the standard def versions anymore. I don't know. I never yeah. heard of that. So, yeah. Well, and listeners, just for a point of reference, we are reviewing the original black and white version. I know yes. this was one of the first movies to be colorized in the 80s. I have never seen the colorized version to my memory, but it's kind of interesting because the DVD, the front cover is in color, and then on the back it contains images from the movies, and those images are in color as well. But my disc specifically says on the box, black and white version only, and it it says disc two, black and white version, but there's no slot for disc one. That's just how it came officially from Amazon. So it's not like a bootleg or anything. I think it was just the studio kind of uh, maybe splitting some things up there. I don't know. Right. I do know that some kind of some of that happened. I've got my cousin, the steel book of the Spider-Man trilogy, like the Sam Raimi trilogy. And on the inside, it was kind of funny because it was like, they took three discs that were published on different kind of platforms. And so the third disc for Spider-Man 3 said feature movie or something like that on the on the disc itself. So I, I'm, I'm sure it's some uh, cost-saving measure where they just take a disc that's already printed uh, in some kind of way and then stick it into that new case with a different printing, different label maybe on the outside. Yeah, that's probably the case. But regardless, I'm happy to have it. And I don't care to have the colorized version. I don't care to watch colorized movies. I know... Last right. year, you can go back and listen to our Christmas special, and Alan, I believe, gave some brief thoughts on the colorized version of "It's a Wonderful yes. Life." Yes, if I remember my, if my memory serves me correctly, I said, "Don't watch it." <laughs> the black and white version is the best. Yeah, I don't really understand why people would go back and colorize things. I've yet to find anything that's been colorized that's really worth it. That makes the experience better right yeah there like i think we mentioned this before there's usually a 
when they when they shoot in black and white, they have to do something kind of special with the way that it looks. I think with lighting is what we had talked about. Yeah. That's so, true. so yeah, transferring that to color kind of makes some things look a bit weird. I mean, now they can of course alter that and make it look a bit better, but even then, it's mastered for black and white film, not color film, unless uh, they were planning on colorizing it in the in the future. Then maybe there was a reason why they, or maybe there's a way that they admit admit uh, I lit it or whatever. So. Well, this film is directed and written for the screen by George Seaton. I've never seen another George Seaton movie. Uh, I do, uh, I do have his other film, The Country Girl, which stars Bing Crosby and Grace Kelly. I haven't watched that yet, but so far this is the only George Seaton movie that I've seen. But this is based on a story by Valentine Davies, and during the time this film came out. Valentine Davies also wrote the short novelization. Uh, the film, oddly enough, released June 4th, 1947. And that's kind of odd to release, at least to my thinking and probably to today's audiences. Having a Christmas movie come out in the summer, usually not the case anymore. But apparently at the time, the studio executives were like, more people go to movies in the summer than any other time, so we want this movie to do well and whatnot, so put it out in the summer. Right, yeah, I heard about that, which, I mean, in some sense, in terms of making money, I guess it makes a lot of sense. But yeah, it is kind of funny that a Christmas movie came out in July, Christmas in July, so... Yeah, that's true. (laughs) Something new that I found out when doing the research for this movie was apparently in the UK, it was called The Big Heart. Yeah, that's interesting i mean okay it isn't uncommon for different parts of the country to have different names for a movie um but yeah the big heart is an interesting title yeah i wasn't sure if i believed it but i did see a poster right Uh, and and it wasn't a fake poster it was a real poster with the big heart on it and there was a few sources corresponding with that and it was on imdb so i don't understand why I'm my my only guess is that they're thinking international audiences wouldn't understand maybe 34th Street but I wouldn't have known it either unless the film specifically made that reference that this right. film for the most part takes place on 34th Street and 7th Avenue which is right. where the Macy's store is in New York City right Who now knows? have you ever been to a Macy's store before Corbin I don't believe so I think I've been inside one, but I'm not entirely, I can't exactly remember. But yeah, I remember when I was a kid, I heard about this Macy's Day Parade and I had never heard of Macy's. I'm just like, what is that? What is Macy's? I've never heard of them before. When the, uh, when did, do you know, do you remember when Batman Begins came out? Was that like 2008? Uh, Batman Begins? That would have been 2000, I want to say six. Because I know Dark Knight came out in 08. Oh, okay. Well, I was in Chicago not long after they had filmed Batman Begins. And I I think there might be a Macy's in Chicago. So it's possible I went into one then. Clearly, it didn't make an impression on me. But I've never been to, to New York City. And from what I understand, the Macy's stores are only in the big cities. They might have been in other cities and kind of have... Uh, kind of declined, but I don't know. So I've, I've never been in there, but I know it's very famous, and clearly most Americans know it from the parade. Right. Yeah. And if and I also have never been to New York City, and uh, but I've been to Chicago many times. So if I've ever been to a Macy's, uh, yes, there is a Macy's in Chicago. Um, I just looked it up. So yes, if I've been to a Macy's, which I think that I have, it has most likely been in Chicago. Uh, yeah, and I'm assuming it's kind of like a. J.C. Penney's Dillard's esque type that's, of store. Yeah, that's kind of the vibe that I got when I walked in there. If I remember, yeah, I, I do remember going into one. It, it's essentially the same thing. Yeah, J.C. Penney's a bit, a bit, I guess, a bit fancier than those. Those are more Sears. Ch- bigger chains. They are all over the place. Yeah, yeah, kind of like a Sears, just a big department store, and also Gimbel's mm-hmm. is the other big one uh, talked right. about in this movie. And I know we uh, in the more modern movie Elf. I think Macy's and Gimbel's are utilized in that movie. Okay, yeah. Gimbel's is one that I had not heard of at all up until this movie. Mm. 
Well, something interesting about the marketing for this movie is it had Maureen O'Hara and John Payne, who are in this movie quite a bit. But regardless, in the posters for this movie and trailers, they're really front and center as they're like, oh, these are the leads. Um, and if you see the original poster for this movie, they're like, these two big leads kind of smiling at each other. And way in the background, very small, is Edmund Gwynn, who plays Chris Kringle and Natalie Wood. Uh, they're very small in the posters. And nowadays, that's changed on my DVD and on the VHS. It's the photo of uh, Chris Kringle and uh, Susan, the, the two characters together, kind of smiling at each other. Gotcha. And you really don't see... Maureen O'Hara or John Payne anywhere. I guess they were bigger stars at the time, so they're trying to play them up and trying to draw people in to see one of their movies. Yeah, that would make sense. I know that that's especially nowadays is what they tend to do is the lead actors, even if they're like a smaller role, sometimes they'll get a big spot on the poster. I watched this one video. This is a bit off topic, but I watched this one video where uh, the names of the actors in the movie are never aligned with their placement on the uh, the poster itself and where they're mm. positioned, which is all done more for, uh, I guess, readability. Because when you read, it's usually from left to right here in America, uh, in most parts of the world. And so when they have the most, like the most, probably the most famous actor's name on the very left and kind of progressively getting to not as much, not as famous on towards the right side. And then they have them front and center, the biggest actor in the very middle. And then people kind of scattered around wherever they need to be. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that's probably what was going on here. It's uh, more of a marketing thing to say, to show that they have recognizable names here, even if they're not like the lead roles. Mm. That's probably the case. Yeah, And this film currently is still very well-renowned, still very popular and highly regarded. Oh, yes. It holds a 96% on Rotten Tomatoes. Very impressive. Yes. And on IMDb, a 7.9. In 2005, it was selected for preservation in the U.S. National Film Registry by the Library of Congress, which is a really big deal for a film to be selected and preserved like that. And oh, yes. it made a number of uh, AFI, American Film Institute, lists, uh, quite a few of them through the years. Yeah. I know that just recently, around the time of this recording, a few weeks ago, the they added, I think, 25 or 50 more movies to the mm -hmm. uh, film registry. Uh, I don't know exactly what I was on there, but I do know that they added a bunch more, a big batch of them. Oh, okay. Uh, I guess I never, I didn't ask. Did you see the uh, remake of this movie? It came out in 1994. I did not. In fact, I had no idea there was a remake until uh, looking up uh, some IMDb stuff. And I saw that there was a remake. I think it was, like, yeah, 94. Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh-huh. And I have never heard of this remake at all. I never sat down and uh, I'm, I have watched it all the way through, I'm sure. But this was one I do remember when I was younger. They would put on for us at school during like when Christmas break was approaching. So they're like, oh, they we would flip this one on. And I remember not liking it as much. I was thinking, oh, yeah, this is good and fine. But I, right. I remember like, oh, we watched the original at home and I, I cared for that one more. And uh, the actor who did portray Chris Kringle in that one, Richard Attenborough, who is John Hammond from Jurassic Park. Oh, interesting. So interesting. I guess, yeah, that would have been... No more than a couple of years after Jurassic Park had released, right? Yeah, I think Jurassic Park came out. I can look real quick. <laughs> came out in. 80, I think it was ninety. I want to say ninety two. Uh, ninety three. Okay, so a year after then. <laughs> yeah, so right after Richard Attenborough was in Jurassic Park, he did yep. this remake, which I think I remember him doing good. Uh, Sir Richard Attenborough, great actor, but uh, you can't beat Edmund Gwynn in this role. Oh, yeah. No way. And I was so glad to learn because I was thinking this the whole time I was watching the movie. I'm like, Edmund Gwynn deserves at least the nomination for this movie. Edmund Gwynn right. won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for this role. Oh, interesting. I do know that it won, I think, three Oscars. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I did know that he did win that one. 
which I'm so glad he won because I thought he just really embraced this role. He did oh, superb. Yeah. Uh, it, this was actually nominated for Best Picture of the Year. I can see why. I can yeah. see why. It, it, people really liked it. And it also won, like I said, it was nominated for four Oscars, won three of those Oscars. Two of the Oscars it won, it won for writing? Interesting. I mean, I it, guess I can see why, but interesting. But I was so I was I never knew this until this. Apparently, back in the day, so uh, Valentine Davies, who did the story for the movie, he won the Oscar for best original story, and George Seaton, who wrote the screenplay, won for best screenplay. Okay. So I wasn't aware there was such a thing as winning for your story because Valentine Davies, uh, he I think he has a story credit on the movie okay but i was just surprised that they had they had separated those categories because usually today it's best adapted screenplay and best original right. screenplay right yeah there's a number of things that have changed with the oscars since i guess his inception we have like we have a bunch more categories now than what they did back in the day well, listeners, we are about to get into the plot for Miracle on 34th Street. If you haven't seen the movie and you don't want it spoiled for you, then go ahead and click pause right now. Go and watch the this wonderful Christmas classic. Come back and click play and we'll be ready to talk about it. Chris Kringle, a.k.a. Santa Claus, portrayed by Edmund Gwynn, travels to New York City, one of the most commercial cities in the world to reinvigorate the city with the true spirit of Christmas, caring for one another instead of caring for material things. On Thanksgiving Day, he visits the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, headed by Doris Walker, played by Maureen O'Hara. When Chris finds the parade's Santa Claus intoxicated, he alerts Miss Walker, who promptly asks Chris to fill in. Not wanting to let the children down, Chris agrees and then is hired on full-time as the department store's Santa Claus for the little boys and girls to visit. Meanwhile, Miss Walker's young daughter Susan, played by Natalie Wood, is spending time with her next-door neighbor Fred Gailey, played by John Payne, who is an aspiring lawyer and who also likes Doris. He learns how practical Susan is. She doesn't believe in Santa, or any stories for that matter, and doesn't even like to be like to play pretend. Later on, back at Macy's, Chris at first irks the head of the toy department, Mr. Shellhammer, played by Philip Tong, then gains the respect of the head of the store, even Mr. Macy himself, played by Harry Antrim. See, Chris is sending customers to other stores for items Macy's doesn't carry. This publicity stunt earns Macy's loyal customers instead of losing them. Chris is a huge success for the store and liked by his superiors, but he quickly runs into trouble when he won't deny he truly is Santa Claus. Miss Walker asks him to deny in front of Susan, but he won't relent. He's forced to take an examination from the store's health care examiner, Mr. Sawyer, played by Porter Hall. Sawyer, a neurotic himself, claims Chris not only to be insane, but actually harboring repressed violent tendencies. He pushes for Chris's firing, but Chris is saved by his Dr. Pierce, played by James C. One day when Chris is having lunch with janitor with his janitor friend Alfred, played by Alvin Greenman, he becomes upset upon learning Alfred is seeing Sawyer daily and that Sawyer is filling his head with a lot of rubbish complexes. Chris pays Sawyer a visit, and Chris's righteous anger concludes with giving Sawyer a knock on the head from his cane. Playing up his injury, Sawyer hatches a plan with Shellhammer to kidnap Chris to a mental institution. Feeling dejected, Chris fails his examination on purpose at the institution, but his spirits are lifted by Gailey, who agrees to represent him as his lawyer to get him out of the mental hospital. When Mr. Maisie finds out Sawyer is suing Chris, he commands him to drop the charges immediately, but it is too late. The hearing is going all the way to the New York Supreme Court. Unless Gailey can figure out a way to definitively prove Chris is the real Santa Claus, Chris will be locked away forever as a mental case. After a few days of gaining and losing ground inch by inch, the U.S. postal workers decide to unburden themselves of all the Santa Claus letters from children by delivering the letters to Chris at the courthouse. Through a little divine providence, by receiving the letters, Chris is recognized by the federal government as the Santa Claus, which prompts Judge Henry Harper and Lockhart to concede Chris Kringle to be the real Santa Claus. 
After the hearing, Chris meets Miss Walker outside the courthouse, where she exclaims she now believes in him. The next day, at Chris's old folks' home, he hosts Susan, Walker, Gailey, Mr. Macy, Shellhammer, and Alfred for a Christmas dinner. But Susan is downcast when she doesn't find her dream present under the tree. See, despite Chris officially being declared a Santa Claus, Susan told him she only would believe in him if he got her her dream house. When Chris can't deliver, she loses hope despite her mother telling her not to. Before they leave the party, Chris writes down a way for them to get home to avoid the heavy traffic. As they pass through a neighborhood, Susan cries for Gailey to stop the car as she leaps out and runs into a home. Her mother and Gailey run after her and Susan exclaims, this is the dream home she asked Chris for. The two of them realize the home is for sale. They're in love. Why shouldn't they get married and become a family? Their surprise and belief is confirmed when they see Chris's cane propped next to the fireplace as credits roll. So here's something kind of interesting that I was thinking of when I finished the movie. And now this is not necessarily a critique on it. This is more of just an observation, I suppose. Uh, had this movie been released, like, say, today, not back in the 40s, uh, I feel like it would have been met with quite a bit of controversy, just given the subject matter that's going for. Not necessarily the fact that uh, Christmas and Santa Claus are kind of an idea there, that it's not just a person, but it's it's very much an idea. More to the fact that uh, you're taking Santa to court, you're taking Christmas to court, and you're essentially saying that these kids should ha- should grow up and should be able to pretend things like that, and that a, and that even a, even an adult should be able to do that as well. I feel like that might be met with a bit of controversy, but due to the fact that this is a, an older movie, came out around the time in the '40s, it's of course it's become a classic since then. And back then, the things were a bit different. What, what do you think about that? So you're saying that there's probably more cynicism today that maybe wouldn't allow yeah. for more of this fantasol, fanta, fantasol, what? <laughs> that wouldn't allow for more of like kind of this fantastical uh, interpretation that takes a realistic approach to by saying like, yeah, because I, I didn't expect it to be a courtroom drama. I kind of forgot about that. Yeah. Um. By saying, yes, there is a Santa and he exists and we should believe, um, probably, probably much more skepticism nowadays would be met with that idea. But I think kind of the more metaphorical side of it is met of uh, kind of that just imagination that Susan mm-hmm. lacks and more so the Christmas spirit is kind of contrasted here with this kind of hard-edged consumerism of just making money and then kind of forgetting about um, like the sales and the profits and like getting ahead in your career and instead just kind of like sticking up for what's right and kind of uh, putting down uh, what's wrong in that way. Right. Yeah. I was just, I was just curious to know what you thought. I mean, it's possible. Of course, it's kind of impossible to tell right now. Uh, But yeah, it is very possible that it could be met with a bit more controversy when it was, if it were to be released today, then had it been released not in nineteen the nineteen forties, but still, even then, there was a really good reason why this is considered a classic. And I mean, we're going to talk about all that kind of stuff here in a sec. But yeah, I just wanted to bring that up just out of curiosity. The the one other thing is that probably would probably be met with more skepticism today that I was thinking about. I didn't really realize this until I was pretty much at the very end of the movie. But I would say this is very much also a Christ narrative, which makes sense since this is a Christmas movie, whereas Chris is the Christ figure. And of course, that would make sense because St. Nicholas is where we get Santa Claus from. And uh, you can see he is this man who doesn't really belong in this society. It's very much a very different world than what he's used to. And so he claims to be something that many people believe he's not and he's persecuted for it and essentially many people reject him but he does have some loyal followers like uh gaily and even some who come to believe in him um like through one way or the other like mr macy and of course um doris walker and susan and uh we can see sawyer is kind of this judas type character who does betray him eventually but then eventually he's exonerated so i think that kind of spirit of christmas 
him trying to bring that back and then um, this kind of subtle but almost not subtle Christ narrative mixed in there, I noticed I found that to be really fascinating. Yeah, I can definitely see where that can be met with some bit more cynicism now. Uh, yeah, and of course, we have also got the thing of people don't exactly like saying Christmas as much anymore. Now they like saying Happy Holidays. So there is that to take into consideration as well, I guess. But yes. I guess that's another, that's a completely different topic as well. So, Oh, yes, that is a, that's a topic for another time that listeners yes. probably don't want to hear us talk about. But regardless, the movie opens with, it's kind of just one shot, you know, just a tracking shot over the credits. And what stood out to me most is this kind of wonderful orchestral uh, Christmassy music that right. I, I don't really notice the score throughout the rest of the movie, except for this section where it really stands out, and I, I really enjoy this. Yeah, I'm absolutely with you. Throughout the rest of the movie, it's there, but it's not like anything it's completely noteworthy. But here in the opening, I think it is at its best, and it, best, and it really does set in the kind of mood that it's going for, for the rest of the film that we're going to see. And it's very, very joyful. And yeah, very Christmassy is, the best, is probably the best way of putting it. It feels like Christmas. Uh, and you just kind of see this man in the very center of the frame, just kind of walking down the sidewalk of New York City with the credits, over, with the credits of course, in the, in the foreground uh, as, they, as they roll. And one of the thing, nice things that the director and cinematographer do very well is framing uh, Chris's face in certain shots when they really kind of want to give you that kind of like awe or kind of wonder of his presence. Yeah. And, excuse me. And we see that right here off the bat with the shop owner who looks up and he's kind of like, oh, oh my goodness, I'm shocked because he kind of can't help but tell who this might be. And mm -hmm. it's so funny because Chris is saying you've got the reindeer out of order as if he can really sp specifically tell uh, which, right. what reindeer they are. And um, it's kind of a uh, kind of a lighthearted introduction to him and lets us know right off the bat that this guy is santa claus right yeah and this also kind of foreshadows the fact that he's also very uh i guess he's very protective and can easily critique somebody when they're wrong about yeah. santa claus and things like that uh we find that we a couple of times we see him kind of correct people or whatever whoa yeah he is a straightforward santa claus yes yes he is that's a very that's very true but i think so yeah we do kind of see him here in the opening when he's correcting the guy and he's like we, yeah we get the sense of okay is he santa claus what is he doing of course later it is more or less confirmed before they actually explicitly say that he is santa claus that he is santa claus and i think edmund Gwynn plays him so well and probably because of that because his conviction as santa claus feels so believable as the character and edmund Gwynn right relates that in such a believable way that I that's why he won the Oscar he does so great and I love his convictions about everything how he will not back down on this or that that he knows to either be right or wrong and uh he still is able to relate such a, a warmth and genuous about it while still uh you know staying true to those convictions Right. And I'm sure that this even kind of went on to craft the more modern view of Santa that we have now. Seeing this per seeing this personality shown on screen in this way kind of helps set in that personality that we come to know and love. Of course, now more modern depictions of Santa have a much rounder belly, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. uh, compared to the time, he would be considered relatively... Uh, maybe mo has more weight than the average person, yeah. but uh, today's more renditions are much more rounder than we would, what than what we would usually what, than what we would see back then. He has an amazing beard. It is perfectly yes, trimmed. Yes, it looks glorious. Yes, I remember that line that Gailey has. He asks, he's like, "I'm gonna ask a question that will just rock the world. <laughs> Does Santo sleep with his beard in or out of the covers?" And he goes, "Out," because they fluff in the cold air yeah he says the cold air makes him grow yes that was hilarious yes. and there there is some comical moments throughout this movie and i'd say one of the first ones is when miss walker is so um flustered with trying to get the parade together and uh, chris wants to see how he's being represented in this big parade comes to find out santa is drunk Yes. <laughs> uh, and the guy's just like, I just want to get through this day. Yeah. And he's he's sitting on his float, sipping away. It's 
and then of course uh, then he gets like super drunk and it's really funny yeah i bet you weren't expecting a drunk santa right off the bat no no i was thinking I, my mind kind of went to uh but to kind of went to the movie elf uh oh, for yeah. a minute there in that scene but but yeah it is just kind of funny how it all just kind of he's how it all he ends up being on the float and how the the only way he did that is because the santa there was drunk and stuff it's it's just a really comical scene that of course is very integral in a few minutes yeah it's, it's really funny when he's like well it's cold the man's gotta stay warm <laughs> yeah. and his voice is really funny too because it's really high pitched he is so high pitched i mean he almost sounds like piglet that little voice yeah. but the movie does a good job of establishing how Chris and Miss Walker become connected. And then they say, oh man, this guy does such a good job. He's so believable that mm-hmm. we should hire him on full time. And then the film uh, quickly does switch perspectives to Susan and Gailey, setting them up also as main players in the story as well. And I thought that was a good idea to really uh, at first give us kind of this solid image of who Chris Kringle will be, but then also to introduce these other characters uh, mostly the main players uh, right away so we can also understand Susan is extremely skeptical because Miss right. Gailey is divorced and her Prince Charming didn't turn out the way she thought so you might as well just kind of be cynical and not just uh, believe in fairy tales and Mr. Gailey is the exact opposite he is uh, kind of has this uh, he's a very much child at heart kind of guy mm-hmm. but he's also a, a lawyer and he has a crush on uh, Miss Gailey and get that funny scene where he wants to be asked to dinner and um, right. she says did I ask all right did I ask my mom for you to dinner all right yeah and I, th- I think that scene is also kind of funny too because Susan is also kind of in cahoots with Mr. Gailey in this yeah. scene because uh, at the very end you kind of get that that idea that they had kind of been planning this but yeah this the opening scene is it's quite nice it's also also interesting because you would think that uh the mom would be down watching the parade which she was in the opening but she then moved upstairs mm-hmm. uh to one of the buildings to overlook it but anyways yeah it, it is, does a really good job at setting up all three of these characters who become kind of main characters in the story aside from Chris Kringle uh and set them up and shows to a certain extent here and it comes it reiterates itself more and more later but you kind of get this yeah this idea that you said where the mom is very i guess empirical she's not necessarily somebody who really believes in imagination due to the fact that she got in a divorce and her prince charming didn't exactly end up the way that she had hoped for and that does kind of pass on to her kid her kid does not believe in santa claus and she does kind of state this here in the opening which is very interesting uh to have a kid who doesn't believe in santa claus and her mom kind of be the reason for that yeah it's a it's a unique setup and also i was thinking it was unique for the fact that that uh, Miss Walker is divorced. She's a divorced single mom, which would have been really uncommon to portray that in a movie back mm-hmm. in 1947. Right, yeah, especially back then, yeah. Divorce wasn't as common as it is now. Uh, I'm sure it still happened, but you never really see... You know, we, I don't think we've ever reviewed a movie where that was a, a part of the of the film in any kind of way. Yeah, not a leading uh, lady. I, I know I haven't seen one. Was that? Well, yeah, not a leading lady who played a divorced right. single mom. So that is unique, but it makes sense in order for right. Susan to be very skeptical. Her dad's not in the picture anymore. And so she's like, why should I, you know, really believe in anything that's kind of fantastical? Because it's just kind of a hard world. And we immediately see right. that's the world she lives in. But then on the other hand, we also, not long after this, were introduced to the character Alfred, who's a very sweet, mm-hmm. simple guy. And the movie does a good job of kind of balancing different levels of people who just wholeheartedly believe without any sort of proof. But then some people really do need a lot of proof. And it comes down to Susan, the little girl, being probably the most uh, skeptical of them all. She needs the most right. proof, which – to me, it makes sense for a child who's probably been in that situation. They're going to be less trusting and they're going to need more of that proof. So it makes sense that her character arc is the one that kind of takes the most to complete there at the end. Right. Right. And it is interesting, too, because we have a lot of talks. Uh, two, I think, situations in, that are really big on this. But the, one of the bigger themes here is uh, 
faith being the thing that you should believe in because it's the thing that's the not really the thing that makes a lot of common sense. Uh, mainly in this movie, it's Santa Claus. Santa Claus, of course, is a ridiculous thing as a man who drives around in a sleigh that flies in the air with 12 reindeer and gives you presents. Every single kid gets a present on Christmas on Christmas. So it's it's kind of a really silly thing, but that's like the whole point. It's imagination. And for a kid who really doesn't have an imagination, uh, you get Chris Kringle coming in there and then he's showing her how to, more or less how to imagine things and how to be basically a kid, how to, how to gain her own childhood, which she kind of doesn't have in this story. Yeah, she's just kind of a sad character how somebody that young yeah. is that supposedly grown up and hard edged right. where she can't even play pretend with the other kids. She doesn't even want to play with the other kids because she doesn't even know what an imagination is, which is crazy. And it just shows like mm -hmm. how hard her mom has raised her, trying to prepare her for the world. And I do say I really do like um uh, uh, Mr. Gailey's character, Fred Gailey, uh, he is kind of a very, there's something very charming about him. Oh, yeah. So he yeah. really plays that off well, where he is great with children. Um, the lady, uh, Miss Walker, really likes him. And also, he's genuinely kind hearted uh, because, in a way, I do feel like he wants Chris to stay with him so he can spend more time with Miss Walker, but I don't think that's, that's – there's nothing wrong with that because he's not – doesn't not care for Chris because clearly he does care for right. Chris. And how they all become fast friends together is very believable. Right. And like you were saying earlier about him, he's kind of a child at heart. Uh, we do kind of get this really quick when he – we have the bedroom scene between the two of them when they're talking – uh, and he asks those questions because at that point he kind of believes that that he is the real Santa Claus. Uh, but it, yeah, it, he is a very interesting character because uh, he is kind of what Susie should be, but she isn't. It's the opposite way, and it is just, it, of course, in this movie, I guess you can say he has the Christmas spirit in him. So he, of course, believes and is always usually. He's I think he's always very happy in this movie. He's not as like, I guess realistic as the other two that he the other two girls that he does end up becoming a family with and one of the uh kind of main world views of the movie comes into play not long into the plot and i thought it was funny because you know i think of we think of christmas as being commercialized today oh, not yeah. necessarily back then but I, apparently it was uh, apparently starting to creep in there probably and that's why they set to the location the setting is in a big department store where you know that's kind of the definition of where commercialism is right. is advertising and uh pushing people to buy things they necessarily don't need and we get a really kind of funny and nice scene here between him and alfred where chris is like uh you know i've been worried for the past 50 50 years he says which that would have been in the Gosh, what, 1897 Yeah, is when he was worried about yeah. commercialism creeping into Christmas? Um, that's so funny. And he uh, is worried about it. And uh, Alfred said, yeah, there's a lot of bad isms floating around the world these days. One of the worst is commercialism. Make a buck, make a buck. I find that so funny. Yeah, I think it is kind of interesting, too, that this movie is connecting – because in some sense, you really wouldn't think about it on the surface level that uh, a lot of Christmas is kind of connected to commercialism. And then in this way, just kind of brings it outright and says, yeah, there's a lot of connections there. Uh, not necessarily in a bad way, but just saying that there is a critique that can be made to this, that it's, Christmas is not just about the presents and not just about what you can get for or what you can buy. It's not really about the money. And they kind of bring this up in a few conversations. But it's just like, it's it's more than just that. It's it's way more than just that. And it's kind of funny how they bring up, and even critique commercialism in Macy's and Gimbel's for, even though they present them here in this movie, uh, and say that it's not necessarily the thing that makes Christmas as special as it is. Right. And then even when the Macy's heads, you know, of the store embrace this new concept which they were so worried about at first which i do kind of find to be uh an interesting little twist to the movie how yeah. the department stores starts 
you know, purposely almost even driving customers away, which I found to be almost maybe a little too much how they're pushing that here in this movie, how every scene from then on, somebody would come up to the store and they'd be like, oh, yes, we know you can go get this at, you know, Walmart. Well, there's no Walmart back then, but you get what I'm saying. Right, right. Yeah, and that's, and it's that's like kind of where time, my... Uh, was kind of where my main thought of maybe there could be come some controversy here with this kind of a thing where there's like driving people away and then the two CEOs become kind of friends because of this. Uh, yeah. It's an idealistic yeah. take on it. And yeah. that's what the movie is trying to present is because first of all, the movie is saying that Santa Claus is a real person, you know, today. And then so kind of going for that idealistic fanciful take on it. Right. It, it makes sense. It works within the movie. It's unrealistic, but it's also kind of funny at the same time how they're still competitors. And there's the scene where um, Mr. Macy says, uh, we're going to be known as the store that puts public interest ahead of profit. And in the meantime, we'll make more profits than ever before. <laughs> And then, yeah, and it's kind of funny because then you, later on you see the gimbals and uh, their CEO, and he's like, how did we not think of this? It's genius. And so it's hard yeah. to get to. Yes, that, that was hilarious how mm -hmm. then the other stores are going to be like, no, we're going to send the competition back to them. And um, in a way, it to me, it doesn't really seem to do much for kind of a – down downplaying or taking away commercialism because yeah. it's still getting people to go buy stuff um at just different stores uh but i guess what they're trying to portray is that uh the stores are not so much worried about uh getting people to buy things they don't need just from them but just trying to be genuine about their shopping interests right more so that's probably more so the secondary element of the story the primary is the, the main relationships that we see and how they develop. Right, yeah. This is just one of the pieces to the puzzle of crafting the message that it has there towards the end, yeah. I think some of the best scenes here in the movie are when we do see Chris um, as the Santa Claus of the Macy's Department Store. And uh, when Natalie Wood's character, Susan, she comes to visit him, she won't sit on his lap. She's very practical. It, it looks like he's holding... Uh, her hand and his hand and mm -hmm. i thought that was a nice touch where they she's not trusting of him she would find that to be so immature and silly for her to sit on his lap so it's a brief shot but i noticed it i thought they that was a really great choice so she's just standing there and kind of like oh you know nice to visit with you yeah, goodbye right but then my favorite scene of the whole movie is the one where and i've always remembered this it's when the lady brings her a daughter that she adopted from an orphanage, and this girl is from – she's Dutch. Yes. And she sits on Santa's lap, and she said, I told her he won't understand what you're saying. But regardless, she – when she saw you in the parade, she knew you were the real Santa Claus. And then they speak – they start speaking Dutch. I don't know whatever language that is. That is such a cool scene. I, I loved how um, they thought about that, and I can also see where a lot of our movies get – this type of Santa Claus from where he's very magical and can pull toys out of thin air and right. pretty much do anything. But my favorite scene. Yeah, I would have to agree with you. This is probably my favorite scene too. It's such a small scene as well. There's, it doesn't exactly come back anytime later in the movie. It's just a scene to show just kind of, I guess the spirit of Christmas uh, in more of its raw form where Santa Claus is able to speak Dutch uh, to this little girl who can only speak that one language and doesn't understand anything else. Yeah, it's a very sweet scene. Yeah, I would agree with you. Probably the best of the movie right here. And what this point is really driving home is that, like, first of all, Christmas is kind of about the children, this childlike mindset of just joy and coming together and more to the point of uh, creating those relationships and the importance of the relationships instead of the importance we attach to just material objects. So it was more important for her instead of to ask Santa for a, a present, which maybe she did, but they sang a song. That's really kind mm -hmm. of the point is kind of that connection we got there. So I th I found it to be a touching scene. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And even adding on to that, they didn't, I mean, and maybe they would have if you had turned on the subtitles, but they didn't have embedded subtitles for this part of the movie. They're just talking to each other and you don't really know what they're saying, of course, unless there are subtitles that 
explain what they're saying, but you still get that connection, which is very interesting. It kind of goes to show that uh, a movie should still be able to communicate to you even if you don't have the audio on. It should be able to tell a story even if you can't don't know what they're saying. And I'm so glad they didn't include subtitles in this. Yes. And the only other th- reference that I can think of off the top of my head, it's it's a it's kind of not connected to this at all, but it's in The Godfather when uh, when Michael is talking to um, whatever the Turk's name is. Uh, they're just speaking in Italian for quite a while, and mm-hmm. there's no subtitles, and it's so effective that way. Yeah. I did notice something interesting is if you pause it when they pull out his employment card. It says his next of kin is all of the reindeer. Yep. With no <laughs> I Mrs. Claus. That. He's I not married. That. Really? Hmm. I didn't know. I, I guess I didn't see that he didn't have a spouse. But I was. I did see that the reindeer were all next of kin. Uh, and that the age was something like. I forget exactly what it said. But it was like as old as I need to be or something like that. Yeah. It says as old as my tongue and a little bit older than my teeth. Yes. Yes. Uh, what? <laughs> Okay, and we also learn learn he lives at Brooks Memorial Home for the Aged on Long Island, which I thought was really fascinating. So clearly he traveled from the North Pole Mm -hmm. to kind of set up residence here for a little while. And uh, he he basically says his ultimate goal is to win over Susan and Doris. And he says, if I can do that, then there's hope for Christmas. Mm -hmm. But if I can't win you guys over, then I'm through. Right. Yeah. And that just, those are the, of course, those are the kind of the two characters that are very, like you said, practical in the way that they view the world. Uh, that's, and that's something that I think that makes this movie even more timeless is that there, it, it kind of goes for that imagination. I think we've mentioned this before, but it kind of goes to that imagination that uh, you really shouldn't just live life completely looking at it from the realistic standpoint. You need to have some kind of imagination to escape from this real world, which is, Essentially what Santa Hill's here to do, like we were talking about. Right. And once again, he uh, kind of drives home this point a little more where he says Christmas isn't a day. It's a frame of mind. Right. And right. that's really fascinating. And I don't think many other Christmas movies focus on that per se. They're more so just involved with kind of the fun story mm-hmm. uh, per se. But I thought this was really interesting how he brought that about and – um, probably also uh, another connection to um, kind of the the true meaning of Christmas is kind of this frame of Christianity where it's not just about Christ's birth and then it's over, but it's just kind of like how uh, Christ transformed the world and how Christmas is a holiday that has uh, transformed the world as well. Right, right, exactly. Now, I did forget about... I couldn't believe I forgot, but as soon as I saw him, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember you, this uh, Mr. Sawyer. Ah, yes. He is crazy, but he plays a great character, though. He does. Yeah, I did not expect him to be the person to essentially be the the antagonist for the story. In retrospect, it makes sense, uh, because if you're looking at it from his own point of view, this whole Christmas thing and uh, Chris Kringle himself just feels really silly. From his point of view. So it makes sense why he is the antagonist here. But I was not expecting him to become that. I thought he was just kind of, uh, I guess, more of an obstacle when his character was introduced than anything else. This does a great job of showing how Mr. Sawyer, who believes that Christmas is essentially a delusion Mm -hmm. for the simple-minded, he has this really kind of bitter... Uh, just kind of very bad life where he's mean to his wife and Chris immediately recognizes all these things. He's like, are you happy in your marriage? And he's like, oh, you bite your nails. You're basically this neurotic, nervous guy. Uh, thinks the world is out to get you. Everybody is wrong except you. You don't care for your wife very much. And uh, this does a good job of kind of blatantly showing us that Those who don't have that Christmas frame of mind, that just benevolent, generous, happy frame of mind, uh, just have 
just kind of sadder lives in general. They're just life quality of life is just poorer that way. Right. And this is also very evident when he, yeah, he mentioned, he asked him, uh, are you, are you married? He's like, yes, I have a happy marriage. And then later on, right after uh, Santa leaves, uh, he has a call from his wife. He essentially just yells at her, uh, which yeah, kind of goes to show that not everything he told Santa was exactly true. And that his life, like you were just saying, not exactly the happiest in this movie. Uh, and he, of course, he, he goes on to try and disprove and get Santa fired and show that psychologically he isn't all there, I guess you could say, uh, which we come to find out is the way that is come to find out is not that it's not the way you should be looking at this kind of a thing. And that looking at it from that, from his viewpoint, of course is going to ruin everything. Yeah. He's completely missing yeah. the point yeah. of Chris and what he's there to do. He just thinks of everything as too matter-of-factly, just like Susan. And I think he's kind of the foreshadowing warning of what Susan will become, is if your parent raises you to be this really strict, boring person, right. then you're just going to look at the world that way. And there's not a lot of love and joy uh, mixed in with that because it's pretty much opposed to it. And uh, I, I find it very funny when... Uh, Mr. Sawyer says, when he shows his latent maniacal tendencies, you're to blame, Miss Walker. And he's like, you know what? He carries that cane around. He's probably a weapon. He's probably going to go on a rampage and start beating us with it. Because right. clearly he shows signs of violence. Right. Yeah, it's very interesting that he he brings it up. He's like, yeah, he's he shows those kinds of signs that it's just typical of everyone like him. Yeah, it's... It, it, he feels like a psychologist. I mean, I guess the technical term here is psychiatrist. Uh, but it is just, it is his character in, in a roundabout kind of way is also just very funny because he looks at it, he looks at the world so empirically with such matter of factness that, yeah, like you said, he just completely misses the point. And when Chris does hit him on the head with his cane, I don't think it's meant as violent, like he's wanting to like do him harm. Mm -hmm. I think he's just so frustrated with him, and he's like, words don't get through to you, so I'm going to have to bop you on the head to set right. you straight. <laughs> and, but of course, this guy, no, I'm not saying that's right, but this guy really plays into it. And it's funny when they um, they see him lying there in his chair, and then he like is about to get up, and then he sees him coming, he's like, oh, I better fake it. Yeah. Yeah, and then he takes that and skews the story, and it's like, yeah, he he attacked me, um, and things like that, yeah. and which is, we know is not true, but yeah. he does that, which is kind of interesting for his character as somebody who's very matter of fact also begins to pop a lie, uh, which makes sense for his character again, but it's just an interesting thing that they bring up that uh, for a character who is always very empirical is now beginning to play into something that is not necessarily something that he really should have done in the first place, which is tell a lie. Yeah, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about that, how he's Mr. Matter of Fact, mm -hmm. and then when things uh, don't go his way, then he's completely willing to invent a fantasy of how just in order to get his way get chris locked away right, right. Uh, which completely exposes him as a fraud and he does exactly what he's against chris for doing except his is the maniacal one right and um i did want to ask you did you notice this line that i thought was really funny when dr pierce is about to leave from talking with them in uh, miss walker's office he's they said uh don't take the employee elevator it's much faster and that employee elevator is super fast, by the way. Did really? You see how it, did you see in that shot when they walk up to it and it like comes up at like lightning speed and comes to a stop? I guess I didn't know. I must have missed that part. Oh, man. It's so fast. Interesting. Anyways, they're like, oh, take the employee elevator. And he says, where is that? I'm a little twisted. Mm -hmm. And she, she says, I'll show you. And he says, oh, no need. I'll find my way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of that, that doctor character is very interesting because him and the psychiatrist are essentially very opposite when it comes to this kind of thing where he's like, nah, Santa's fine. Leave him alone. Where the psychiatrist is very much on the on the case of get him out of here. He's a nutcase. Uh, and it's, it's very funny. There are bands that go back and forth because they're t technically both doctors, but they both have so different viewpoints on this. It's, it is very interesting to see that, that one scene when they have the discussion. And I was really confused on Sawyer's actual position and degree because Chris says, do you even have a psychiatry degree? 
And he's like, well, yeah, it's like a hobby of mine. I've studied it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just confused why he's employed there. To me, he seemed like, like more of a general specialist or something, but he's the one that seems to have delusions of grandeur with his like capabilities. Right. Right. I know I did learn it in psychology. I forget the terms. That was like three years ago when I learned it. Uh, but there are two different kinds of like psychologists that can uh, administer in some, certain things. There's one kind of psychologist. I think it may be psychiatrist. Once again, I can't remember the exact term, but they can recommend to do something. And then there's a doctor form of that, which which can prescribe certain medications and, re and write down like admittance admittance letters to mental winter wars and things like and things like that my guess is the psychiatrist here is just meant to uh suggest to do certain actions he may yeah. you don't necessarily need to have certification for that but just know of course know your stuff which in this case he does but it's more for him it's not necessarily something that he is prescribing he's just he's suggesting a lot of things and he thinks he's very freudian with his suggestions when right before what precipitated the uh argument and chris hitting him on the head was when chris is speaking with alfred and alfred said oh yeah he helps me a lot he he told me i hate my father i never knew it but um, you know i'm glad i know now yeah and i'm just you know i'm an awful person but he's gonna fix me and uh, just thinks everybody's a psycho and he is this amazing doctor that has to fix everybody uh just a complete nutcase but he's a great character um, kind of switching gears here, though, kind of going back to Susie and uh, Santa, I thought it was really creative when um, Chris said, you've heard of the British nation, the French nation. Well, this is the imagination. And I thought that was kind of a neat way of introducing that to her. Yeah, that is an interesting way that he he gets to her on her own level. More or less, he brings in uh, something that I guess she would understand a more realistic approach, and then says, "This is how you do it." And then takes it from there, and then moves it from there into ne the next steps, which we do get to see. He, the one of the last things that we see with them is he's teaching her how to be how to pretend to be a monkey, which is very funny because it doesn't really seem like she's acting like a monkey there, but we you know it, the idea is there. It's her first time. We'll cut her some slack. Yeah, we'll cut her some slack. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think Chris makes a good point when he's putting her to bed and she says, well, if you're Santa, you can do anything. You'll get me the house. Right. And he says, well, you know, kids who ask for locomotives or B-29s don't get them. And uh, I thought that was a good point, but it was kind of funny how he uh, said that. And Susie is very the doubting Thomas of the story <laughs> where it's going to be like, I'm going to have to see it to believe it. Right. Otherwise, I don't. Um there was this scene right after that where she chews gum and puts it away like she's going to chew it again. I didn't understand that. And there's also the scene where Chris uh, blows the gum. And I'm assuming it's maybe it's her used piece. I don't know. And then he pops it and gets it stuck in his beard. That just I don't understand why they included that in the movie. Yeah, I I, th I know. OK, so I know. I think the the reason before with the with the bubble gum was just kind of foreshadowing that comes back in this scene that you were talking about when Santa blows the bubble. I don't think it was her piece. I think it was an extra one he had laying around because I think the line before that was "Do you have any more of that?" But I th I don't know exactly the real reason why it's in this movie other than maybe just to add on to the fact that he's getting down to her level in this kind of a thing and that bubble gum was very much attached to children especially in this time. And mm -hmm. so doing that is, I guess, going to show that there is more children, child inside of Susie than what we're, what we're led to believe. But yeah, it is an interesting scene. It is uh, very interesting that they decided to add it in there when Santa blows the bubble and it pops and it gets all in his beard and stuff. And then coming to the third act is kind of a courtroom drama. Yeah, which is very interesting for the movie that has been set up before this point to have switch gears and become a courtroom drama now and i guess this is probably the storyteller's way of thinking this is how we're going to definitively prove chris kringle is santa is through a legal process and i think some of this courtroom drama kind of has like a bit of a bad rap today or it's kind of used not in the best way with certain movies today um, the one that comes to mind is God's Not Dead 2, 
where they're like, we're going to put God on trial. Yeah. Blah. And um, this is not yeah. like that. Right. But, this one, it, they do a good job of making it feel like there's a good reason for it to be there. Right. I And I couldn't help but think, especially since this is a retrospective, how courtroom dramas were and they were pretty popular back then i was i'm thinking of like jimmy stewart's anatomy of a murder Mm -hmm. and the manchurian candidate and other ones like that were uh pretty well-regarded courtroom dramas but then uh over the years uh a few good men was probably the only last good one i can think of it's kind of become uh not not the best use of storytelling, I feel. I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, we st- of course, we still see it today. It's been a thing for, I think, since almost the beginning of, beginning of cinema that we've had these kind of courtroom dramas, especially in the golden age. But yeah, I, yeah, I kind of agree with you. They're not as... They're very interesting nowadays. There are still some good ones out there. I mean, I know that Matlock was one that I remember watching uh, the TV show a little bit to a certain extent. So yeah, they're... Especially, I would even also bring up, uh, crap, To Kill a Mockingbird, that's it. That one was also ends with the courtroom drama in it as well. Yeah, I kind of agree with you. Uh, this one makes sense, but the ones nowadays, it, it's kind of one of those things where it's popular, so they keep it, they keep adding on to it, and now it's kind of become a thing where, unless it's really good, of course, it's kind of become a thing where, oh, just another courtroom drama. They're not really that great, usually. Yeah, it's and this one is clearly a lighthearted one. Yes, yes. They're not. It's not a heavy courtroom drama. It's just like there is there are courtroom drama elements here. They don't really dive too deep into it, which makes sense because had they done that, it would have made the scene wildly out of character for the movie. <laughs> well, we have the judge who is kind of a really nice guy, actually, and we have that funny scene where his grandkids bypass him. Their grandpa is persecuting. Or excuse me, no, prosecuting uh, yes. Santa Claus and even the district attorney's son doesn't want to have anything to do with his dad. And um, I do kind of find that to be a bit delightful how all these adults are kind of going after Santa and they're like, what What the heck? It's Santa. Like, what is your problem? You know, or at least it's a guy who thinks he's Santa. So it just feels uh, over the top, but once again, that's why I was saying this kind of did feel like a bit of a Christ narrative here, where they're unnecessarily persecuting this guy for, you know, what what harm has he really done by claiming right. to be Santa Claus? Right. right. I mean, at le- the very least, he's a very positive image, and as we've seen many times before this, anything that he's done is reflected positively on basically everyone involved. Uh, I think aside from the psychiatrist who we've been kind of been shown to not really be the best frame of mind in the first place. The one thing that I did kind of think was interesting, and I guess they probably handled it as well as they could have, but probably the first and probably half of the second act is focused on um, Susan and her mom. But then I feel like during this courtroom era, they really kind of drop out of view for a while. Yeah. And I don't feel like that much time has passed. But then when Mr. Gailey comes to um, Miss Walker's apartment, I feel like they've been dating for a while. And we never got that setup where he asks her to dinner or they really start dating. They've just been kind of, you know, just kind of hanging out with each other and Chris and Susan together. That just kind of was like, oh, whoa, they're, they're dating already. Right, yeah, there are quite a number of characters here that we have to keep track of. That's just kind of a side effect, I'm guessing, of having so many characters is that you have to spend a lot of time not with the ones we should be focusing on, or maybe the ones that are considered the main characters of the story, Susan and her mom and Gailey and their relationships and things like that. They are there, but they're not as maybe focused as they probably could have been in this movie had we not had as many characters. But having the characters that we do have makes sense why they're here. I do agree with you. I wish they would have kind of. I wish they would have spent a bit more time with these characters because they are the most interesting, in my own opinion, uh, here as well. And I would say another critique that I have is this. I mean, this is kind of a small, smaller critique, but this movie is not very subtle in what it's trying to say. It's pretty forward. Uh, you can pretty much pick out everything that 
every element that's there that's adding on to the message. Not to say that the message is shallow or that it's bad or anything like that. I'm just saying that the way that they present it is not necessarily the most hidden when it comes to writing. The other thing is, I think uh, Miss Walker's belief that Chris truly is and she has this rock solid faith in him all of a sudden, I think that comes about either too quickly or the way it's just introduced uh, just feels like too fast almost because I understand how they set it up as the skeptic and then mm. she talks with uh, Gailey and he's like that's really not any way to live life you're kind of in for a sorry lonely life if that's the way you look at it and then she sees that Chris is she's like well he doesn't deserve this and you know there are like bits and pieces of evidence that are more so in his favor but then all of a sudden she's just like yep yeah, I completely believe in you and uh, I I kind of feel like they could have fine-tuned that a bit more, especially towards the end when he says, uh, she says, oh, can you come over for dinner tonight? And he says, oh, it's Christmas Eve. And she's like, oh, right. I wasn't sure if she still really believed him, but then the next day she clearly does. So I would have liked a little more finessing in that area. Yeah, I, I do agree. And maybe we would get that in the extended cut because I know that there is a <laughs> the, one of the DVD releases has a few more minutes added on to it. So does it perhaps, really? Yeah, it's like 101 minutes and this is 96 minutes. Oh, so there's wow. like about five, six minutes there okay. of, of more, I guess, material. So perhaps in that cut, I haven't seen it, of course, but... Maybe we would have gotten that kind of a thing that you're looking for. Maybe some more clarification. In this cut, we don't have that. I think this is the original theatrical, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's the only cut I knew about. Yeah, that's I just saw it because I was on IMDb. And I, it was funny how I found it because I Googled uh, America on 34th Street. And on the sidebar, it said, oh, an hour and 54 minutes. And I said, hang on, that's <laughs> not right. Because I knew it was only about a little bit over an hour and a half. So I looked it up yeah. and IMDb has two cuts. One's a DVD cut and it's like an 101 minutes. And then the typical usual one that you're going to come across is the 96 minute cut. Mm. That was also there. Okay. So, yeah, but, but guess, I, perhaps it's there. Perhaps there's more clarification in that cut. I have no idea. I don't know. That's very surprising. That's interesting. Regardless, I don't think we necessarily need an extended cut, though. Yeah. I mean, like I said for what we get there's really yeah there really is no good reason to have one perhaps they would have fleshed out a couple of things and maybe there's timeline stuff that they added in there it's impossible to tell at this point but yeah you're kind of right there really is no good reason for one the movie's pretty much fine the way it is without more stuff added to it but hmm, i don't know it's nice that the final day of the hearing is on christmas eve and uh, it's good because I think this could easily lose children watching it and think, oh, this is boring. But because they they subpoena the district attorney's son to testify, yep. which I found to be so funny, uh, that does keep kids engaged and uh, talking about the letters. So it's kind of a simple way that he's exonerated. But I do think it is still kind of a solid way that they come about that where they're saying the post office, which is a part of the federal government, if the federal government is giving these letters to him, recognizing him as Santa, then you have to conclude that, yes, he is. That's the way we're going to prove it because they never right. really had any proof until then. So I did think it was a cool twist. Yeah, it was, it is a kind of a funny twist because it's something that you would never think of. We hear about this quite a bit now that the post office is getting so many letters written to Santa uh, a year or whatever. Um, now, what they do with it, I have really no idea. I'm pretty sure there's some article that explains what they do with they actually do with those letters. Um, but so, yeah, it is an interesting way to bring in the post office being a part of the government and saying that since the post office recognizes that yada, 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 that means that logically, therefore... Uh, Santa here, Chris Kringle is the actual Santa, and that Santa actually exists. Yeah, it is. It is kind of funny. It is kind of funny too that we see the uh, the guy working in the mail room. He just happens to pick up the letter and it's like, "What if we? Uh, what if we actually bag up all of those letters and send them to this guy?" And the guy, the guy, the manager is like, "That's like fifty thousand letters." He's like, "Yeah, let's do it." So it's it's just kind of funny that whole scene, how it all kind of plays out and stuff. It does, it, and it makes for a funny scene. When mm -hmm. they dump him all on the judge said on my desk, and then they jump him on his desk. That was a funny scene. Yep, yep. 
I, I do. Now, they didn't dump every single bag. They just dumped a couple of bags because you could see a couple next to the desk. Oh, yeah. I would, would kind of wonder. I would be kind of funny to see they dumped everything on his desk I that they had. Mm-hmm. I wish they would have. And there's also a few great shots during the courtroom scenes as well. Like when Mr. Macy concludes that, yeah, I, I do believe he's Santa. And they kind of have the side profile of Chris. And his face is just glowing. Yeah. I think that's such great acting from – uh Gwen, how he is able to portray that just glow and joy in his character portrayal of Santa. It's really great. And the next day on Christmas Eve, uh, everybody believes now because Dr. Pierce got his x-ray machine, but right. Susie didn't get her house. And uh, it's kind of sad because she's like, I'm I'm kind of believing in this and I'm really excited about it. <laughs> and then right. the next day on Christmas Day, she's like, he's what what she's yeah. like i knew it all along the world is a hard place right yeah for a moment i mean it is kind of, kind of interesting too because if this person really is santa you would assume that well he'd be able to do it no no problem and even he's like uh i don't know how possible it would be for me to do that yeah. but he accepts the challenge anyways there at the beginning and then of course it does end up coming true later but yeah it is kind of disheartening when you see Susie. she's like you really aren't real i knew it all along and you um, for a moment, I was like, it's not going to end there. There's no way it could end there. Dark of course, twist. it doesn't later. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Just fade to black the end. Yeah. <laughs> Roll credits. Oh, no. This is not not that movie. Mm-hmm. But uh, the one thing they did kind of think was just really dumb, I kind of wish they wouldn't have done, was when Susie just mumbles to herself – for the rest of the day until they find the house. She just says, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. They should have just had her be quiet and look really sad. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. It's weird. Anyways. Um, okay. So when I was younger, I never noticed the foreshadowing kind of, it's probably towards the end of the first act, probably mostly beginning of the second act actually. And how that comes about. See, I thought that Chris did buy the house. For them. When I was younger, I thought, oh, he bought the house for him. Wow, that's great. But come to realize, he finds out that um, Gailey uh, does want a house kind of in that area out of the city. And so does Susan. So he finds the perfect house for them that would, you know, suit them well. And he tells them to drive right by it, knowing that Susan would spot it and um, she th- it would be for sale and stuff so he kind of sets it up for them to buy it for them to get married and then buy it so right. i thought oh okay so he's still fulfilling her wish but more in a practical way actually which is pretty cool right it is yeah it is very interesting that they go once again the more practical route to get down to Susie's level and then build up that imagination because she's running through the house and saying this is exactly what i wanted this is exactly what i had it had in mind when I wanted my room in the backyard, you now the swing set, all kinds of stuff like that. And yeah, you, it's really sweet because you get that the cane and they're like, wait a minute, what's going on here? And by the fireplace, yeah, it's a very really sweet moment that Susie's dream of the only thing that she wanted was a house. And it, it is interesting too because it's not necessarily a toy. It's not something that in the set in the, in the moment that they have together, that it's not necessarily what she wants is not necessarily. Uh, something that's a material thing. It's kind of a thing that's going to last a long time. She wants that family again uh, and that house. And that does come true in this very end scene, but it takes a while to get there. Uh, it's very interesting because, of course, her practical side of her is kind of coming out at that point. Uh, but it's something that, of course, the movie's trying to get at is that it lasts much more longer, or I guess much longer than a toy would and getting a house. Yeah, it's a great scene here at the end where... Uh, she's really joyful about uh, pretty much not necessarily the house, but that she her family is made whole again. Uh, she right. has been, you know, like we've said, kind of a sad life and it's very serious. And now we see that it's all kind of come better. So in a way, it's very much a fairy tale ending, but it's also something that is. Uh, kind of something that's very admirable that we should be joyful about and and strive towards right. is that Christmas frame of mindset, like he said, of kind of families coming back together and being restored and these relationships and just having more hope and joy and, and peace in the world through that as well. Right, um, right. The one thing that I was a little confused about, though, well, two things, actually. 
I thought it was odd when Susie jumped out of the car and she said, wait, Uncle Fred. Did she ever call him Uncle Fred prior to this? I, I've i seen this movie a lot and I don't ever yeah. remember that. Yeah, I don't think she ever does. I, I don't recall her ever actually ever saying Uncle Fred up until this moment. Hmm. So. Okay. Well, the other thing is, I think the movie kind of has a weird closing line where they see his cane and he's like, maybe I didn't do such a wonderful thing after all. Yeah. I just, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. <laughs> see, I was wondering about that. And my <laughs> my guess is that the Santa Claus, that Chris Kringle isn't actually Santa Claus. Maybe he actually is a crazy man. But the idea is what <laughs> is what makes this movie so, well, well, I guess what makes this ending make sense to me is that the idea of Santa Claus is that he's giving to others and making things better uh, and building relationships and things like that. And so this was his house and that he put it up, he put it up for sale and went on to the city to do other things and gave it to them inadvertently. And the idea that him giving this gift of the house to them, uh, that was his own personal thing, is what makes this ending, for me at least, make sense. And that's a possible interpretation. Yeah. I'm still probably going to go with that he really is Santa Claus. Because that just seems to probably fit more so with the narrative and probably tone of what even the filmmakers were trying to achieve. But the one question I did have was when, when and if did you believe he was Santa Claus? Were you skeptical from the beginning or did you buy into it? Or I want to know your thoughts. Okay, so in the beginning, I was wondering, are they actually making, is this a crazy man pretending to be Santa Claus? Especially in the opening when he's critiquing the guy with the reindeer. But then I kind of, as the movie went along, I was like, okay, so this obviously is Santa Claus or at least a guy portraying santa claus and i guess the more it went on the more i began to believe this really is santa claus and then there towards and then there at the end uh i was more or less just like well is he actually santa claus uh because of the cane in the house but yeah i mean i was pretty much sold about 15 20 minutes in that he really was santa claus uh and that the rest of the movie was just trying to uh prove that he really is santa claus uh and the flesh so, do you think this is the best portrayal of Santa Claus you've seen on film, or is there another one that you think is better? I mean, I guess I could say it's the best one, because I don't know if I've ever seen any other Santa Claus as, as fleshed out as this one. Uh, so, yes, I suppose, but I guess just due to the fact that I haven't really seen anything that's better. I Maybe there is. I have no idea. I haven't seen it. So, Alan, what is your rating and recommendation for Miracle on 34th Street? Well, no wonder this is a classic. Uh, I mean, this movie does kind of get everything that is Christmas into one movie, into one big package, and does show that living a life, especially a child, uh, for a child's sake, living a life that is so uh, matter-of-fact is kind of boring and also very depressing, uh, and that you need that imagination whether or not you're a kid or adult, uh, to is kind of I guess escape from reality every every so often to keep I guess keep yourself not so sad as like what happened with their mom. Yeah, this is a rather fun movie to watch. It is one that I can totally understand why it is a classic, and I really enjoyed watching it. And one that I would probably go back to uh, maybe later uh, next Christmas sometime. Now that I've actually seen it for the first time. Uh, overall, yeah, I mean, despite my couple of uh, critiques that I have of it being a bit. Uh, forward with its ideas. That's not really anything that bad, though. I mean, I totally understand why they did it. Uh, overall, yeah, I really did enjoy myself, and I think I'll give it an 8 out of 10. A strong recommend from me. Miracle on 34th Street is a wonderful Christmas film with the best portrayal of Santa Claus I've ever seen. I have fond memories of this film as a child, and I love experiencing it again today. It's one for all ages can enjoy, and that should not be forgotten. Edmund Gwynn's acting is superb, the story is inventive, and the worldview of subtly putting the Christ back in Christmas is admirable. I love A Miracle on 34th Street. I'm giving it 8 stars out of 10 with a strong recommend. So I'm really glad we got to review this for this Christmas yeah. special. Uh, definitely one of the classics, like It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, so I th and one that I don't know if many people still watch today since it came out in 47, I 
I know it's famous. I know people have still heard of it, but I just don't right. know if very many people still watch it right. today. I know that people know of it. I know that much. I know that it's made a name for itself, and that it's one that you all hear a lot about during this time of year. But you, yeah, like you said, maybe not watch as much as maybe even It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, this not watched maybe nearly as often as that one or a lot of their Christmas movies, especially maybe Elf. I know that one's a modern classic at this point, especially for this time of the year. Yeah, it definitely is. But that's why we did want to review this movie to bring it to your attention. And possibly if you haven't seen it in many years, hopefully it'll spark your attention to go back and rewatch it. Or if you just did go back and rewatch it and you listen to um, our thoughts, we want to hear your thoughts as well. If you have any fond memories of this movie or if you showed it to your kids and watched it with your family for the first time then we want to hear those stories and those kind of uh, fun Christmas traditions and what other Christmas movies you like to watch as well. So this is our last review for 2018. Yes, it is. We're going to have to start working on the schedule soon. <laughs> yes. Because uh, next year's coming up. <laughs> yeah, next year's coming quick. So we will be working on that schedule and letting you know what movies will be like what retrospectives we will be doing, but also um, what possible theatrical releases we'll be uh, checking out and reviewing as well. So yeah, I think this was a great review to end 2018 on. We had oh, yes. a ton of great retrospectives from a wide variety of genres that I was so glad we got to do. Oh yeah, I'm glad we got Halloween over with. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we it was a lot busier year than I guess we were both kind of anticipating. Uh, I know that we had planned a number of different things and just kind of went for it. And a couple of things we had planned, we were just like, well, uh, we don't have time for that. Yeah. So we ended up not being able to do it. So maybe next year we'll be able to fit it into the schedule. But yeah, overall, really fun year to have a lot of different retrospectives uh, coming out. Yeah, it, it really was. And I know both. Both of us graduated college this year, so yes, it was a busy year for the both of us, probably more so for Alan, because uh, he just recently graduated where I've been right. done for a little longer, but nevertheless, it was still busy for both of us. I know we had some uh, kind of some other special um, kind of uh, more premium episodes planned that we didn't really get around to, but that will be much more viable for next year to kind of push out some of that premium right. content as well. And, uh, well, this will not be our last podcast of the year uh, because, well, it might be our last podcast together, <laughs> but uh, we will be like we did the previous two years. We will be doing our best and worst of 2018 where we right. just individually talk about our personal best movies we saw and then the worst movies we saw and maybe just some in between. So we'll see. I'm looking forward to uh, crafting that list and seeing there are still quite a few movies that I need to watch before 2018 is over. They might not have any effect on my list whatsoever. I don't know, but I do want to get those watched as best as possible. So we'll see. And I know during this time, there's a ton of movies and theaters that just came out that I want to see, but I can't go afford to go see all of those movies. So those will have to wait as well. But the other right. thing, listeners, you have to look forward to is the Oscars. Uh, ah, yes. Just a tiny bit over a month until we know the uh, the 2019 Oscars. So I'm very excited about that. I am already have been crafting my list, listeners, for my Oscar predictions for what I think will get best picture, best actor, best etc. So I've I've already been working on that throughout the whole year. And we'll see how close I am. Uh, we'll see how that lines up. So what we will do, we will do a uh, predictions podcast where we will give our thoughts of what we think will go to the uh, 2019 Academy Awards. And then we'll do uh, reactions podcast just being like, oh, yeah, this this makes sense. Or it's like, well, what? Where did that come from? And mm -hmm. then, of course, we will watch the Oscars and then give you our thoughts. We'll do a post-Oscars uh, podcast just like we did last year. We we went and recorded it uh, just right after the Oscars finished. Yeah, yeah, we did. It was right when the credits were going for the uh, for the last thing. We were just like, oh, yeah, let's go talk about it. And we did. Yeah. Yeah, it was right after. So we'll be doing that again this year, which means we will be watching a ton of movies Yes. Of course. Hopefully this year we can be able to watch every at least best pictures, watch them all before 
uh, the before the award ceremony happens? Well, I know that we will be able to because you're in town and there's a Regal in town and they do the Best Picture Festival. So for oh, yeah. 30 bucks, well, we can see all case. of them as many times as we want. Perfect. Well, in that case, that'd be easy then. Yep. It's a good to go. It makes it easy and convenient. Yes. So I'm really glad for that. So uh, yeah, we will be able to give you... Uh, last year was more complete of an Oscars talk than the year before, and this next year will be even more so than that. I think last year right. there's only like three movies that I didn't get to see, and they were quasi minor, so I wasn't too frustrated about that. I missed out on Ferdinand. Right. That was the big upset for me. <laughs> Not dang. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but regardless, we will be coming to you very soon with our best and worst of 2018. And then we'll be talking about our Oscar predictions not long after that. So listeners, you start making your Oscar predictions as well. Uh, you, you can make some comments, send us an email. Uh, all of that's in the description below, how to contact us, write it on our Facebook page, what you think the Oscar predictions will be for, uh, this coming year. We're looking forward to talking about that. I love Oscar season. I'm very excited for Oscar season. We'll see. Hopefully they don't mess it up. It's already been lots of controversy going on with yeah. different things. I don't know. I just want them to just get it straight. It's just an award ceremony. Don't make it into a big thing that has to take forever and whatnot. Anyways, I'm sure it'll be fine. But listeners, once again, thank you much. Thank you much. <laughs> well, I guess that works. Once again, Close listeners, enough, thank you. <laughs> Once again, listeners, thank you very much for joining us on our Christmas special. We want to wish you a Merry Christmas. We hope you have a great time with friends and family. And we will be coming back to you uh, with those uh, other podcasts very soon. But once again, thank you for joining us on the last review of 2018. We will see you in 2019. Have you seen, wait, by the way, have you seen West Side Story? No, I have not. Okay, Natalie Wood plays the teenager in that movie, the um, young adult teenager. Oh, okay. Yeah. She plays a Spanish person. Gotcha. Yeah, I know I need to watch Spanish. that. Or a Mexican, I don't remember. <laughs>